chapter 5. I have a lot uh, to say. <laughs> um, I don't know that I'll be able to say it all. Um, I have about, to be honest with you, I've got about five outlines in this one message. I don't know really which one uh, God's going to manifest himself in, which one he really wants to draw from. So I'm just going to preach through them and see what happens tonight. <laughs> Amen. And, uh, but Mark chapter 5 is one of, uh, one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. It's probably one of the most preached chapters and for very good reason. Uh, but Mark chapter 5, if you've got that, would you stand up together and let's read some scripture. How many of you have your Bible with you tonight? We'll pick it up. Oh, that's good. Boy, ain't that a blessing? We, our good friend over in Korea is risking his life to put Bibles in the hands of people and I don't know how many is in here tonight, but there's a whole bunch. <laughs> and uh, boy, what a blessing that is, just to have a, just to have a copy of God's Word. And, uh, mm. I mean, knowing what it is and knowing what it's done. Yeah. And knowing the price that's been paid by men that don't know you. <laughs> mm. We're an ungrateful generation. We're an ungrateful generation. I'm a Baptist, and by the grace of God, I'll die a Baptist, and I'm thankful for Baptist doctrine. I don't believe it's the closest to Bible doctrine. I believe Baptist doctrine is Bible doctrine. And I thank God for a good Bible Baptist heritage. I thank God for that. But we're ungrateful. And I think because of the ease that we have and the great liberty that we've been given in this country and the great, uh, I guess, uh, availability to God's Word, we've lost uh, its value. And I, I read a story, and, and I'll read in a minute, and uh, I read a story about uh, over there in Africa where, the, where, the, where they were mining diamonds, and, and uh, there were so many diamonds, and there was a miner over there, and he was walking through town, and there were some kids sitting on the ground playing marbles, and, uh, and he got to looking closer, and they had rough diamonds, and they were, so, uh, they were just so uh, readily available there that these kids were in the street playing marbles with raw diamonds, one of the most valuable stones in the world. And I think what we have in our hand is more valuable than all the diamonds in the world, yet I think we're so guilty of coming to church and playing marbles, <laughs> looking at them as little cute stories, failing to realize that what we're reading is indeed the very Word of Almighty God. He could have said anything he wanted to, but these words are inspired and they're of God and they're true. And Thank God for them. Amen? Amen. Amen. Mark chapter 5, let's begin reading in verse number 1. We're going to read several verses. Mark 5 verse 1. And they came over unto the other side of the sea into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs and no man could bind him, no, not with chains, because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains and the chains had been plucked asunder by him and the fetters broken in pieces and neither could any man tame him. And always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs crying and cutting himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him and cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? You rest assured that the world don't know who Jesus is. Them demons know who Jesus is. They don't just know who he is. They know what he is, Son of the Most High God. I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him much that he would not send him away out of the country. Now there was there nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding. And all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine that we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave, and the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine. And the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. They were about 2,000 and were choked in the sea. 
And they that fed the swine fled and told it in the city and in the country. And they went out to see what it was that was done. And they came to Jesus and, and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting and clothed in his right mind. And they were afraid. And they that saw it told them how it befell to him that was possessed with the devil and also concerning the swine. And they began to pray him to depart out of their coasts. And when he was come into the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends, and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee, and hath had compassion on thee. And he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him. And all men did marvel. I want to draw your attention back to verse number 9. He asked him, what is thy name? He answered saying, my name is Legion. Finish it out loud with me. For we are many. I want to preach to you for a little bit tonight on freed from thousands of enemies. Freed from thousands of enemies. Pray with me. Pray for me. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful evening to be in church. Thank you for what it means to be in church on a Sunday night. And God, I pray tonight as we look through this uh, wonderful passage of Scripture, there is so much truth, there's almost no wrong place to start in it. And God, I pray that you will uh, manifest yourself out of it. I pray you will feed your children and encourage the flock tonight. I pray that you will admonish our souls and give us strength. I pray as we read through this passage that it will strengthen our faith in you. I pray it will deepen our realization of what you are and what you are capable of doing and, and exactly what it means for you to be almighty and exactly what it means for you to be omnipotent. Exactly what it means when them demons said the Son of the Most High God. I pray tonight as we leave church that we will know as well as they did what that means. I pray we can feel in our souls what, uh, what comfort and what, what awe and what authority that you have as the Most High Son of God. I pray you help us tonight. And I know that there is, there is no one here less deserving of this position as me. God, I pray that you bless us tonight. I pray that you help us. I pray that you would have me say what you would say if you were preaching from Mark chapter 5. I pray I can say what you would say. I pray I can say it how you would say it. Lord, I need your mind and I need your heart. God, I know that your people live in perilous times. God, we live in an evil day. God, we live in a wicked society and a filthy generation. God, we live in a day, Lord, towards the end, toward, close to the last days, close to the finish line of this thing. God, we live in a horrible time and your people, your children, your babes in Christ are subject to the most gross evil and to the nastiest spirits. And God, I pray that you help us tonight and give us strength. God, give us strength. Put on us the whole armor of God that we may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil for they are many. And I pray you help us in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. I'm going to need you to have church with me as much as you can tonight. Uh, my heart is full. My, my soul is just overwhelmed with the goodness of God. And uh, I can't think of a better place to preach from than Mark chapter 5. And uh, the book of Mark uh, is, uh, is a wonderful book. And it sets forth Jesus as the servant. Matthew shows him as the king. Luke as the son of man. John as the son of God. But... Mark portrays Christ as the servant of God. If you had to pick a theme verse out of the book, it would be Mark chapter 10 and verse 45, where Jesus says, The Son of Man has come not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Now, oftentimes, especially in this modern era of theology, we get confused that, that Mark is showing Christ as our servant. But let me just say, Christ is not our servant. He is God's servant. 
He is the Father's servant. Christ is not, he, 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 he is not your servant. He is not your slave. He, you do not boss him around. He is not your uh, uh, ball boy. He is not your lucky charm. He is not your spare tire. Christ is not our servant. He is God's servant. One writer aptly said in Philippians 2 that he said that being in the form of God, he thought it not robber to be equal with God, but took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. He said we see all four gospels there in that verse. He starts off being in the form of God. He said, well, there's Matthew, the form of God. God is that supreme authority. God is that high-ranking king. And so Matthew portrays him being in the form of God. Let's turn over to Philippians chapter 2. I want you to see this. Philippians chapter 2. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. Y'all okay if I just preach a while tonight? Let's look in verse number 6. We'll see all four Gospels here in verse number 6 and 7. Are you there? Say amen. amen. Who being in the form of God, there, there is, as Matthew portrays him as the king. In that opening genealogy, Matthew chapter 1, traces him as the king. Then he says, started not robbery to be equal with God. Well, there's the book of John. John's chief objective in writing his Gospel is to show Christ as the Son of God. He is deity. He is divine. He is more than just Son of Man. He is Son of God. And so John's gospel portrays him as equal with God. Verse number 7, But made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. There's the book of Mark. Mark portrays him as a servant. There is no genealogy listed in the book of Mark because the, the servant's genealogy was never listed. And then he took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. There's the gospel of Luke, the son of man. But, but the book of Mark, turn back to Mark, the book of Mark shows him as the servant. And, uh, and, and though Mark portrays him as the servant of God, these pages that we are looking at tonight, they magnify him so high, and they show his almighty sufficiency, his omnipotence, his, his great strength, his godlike power. In chapter 4, you remember this story as the disciples are going across the sea, and there, there comes up a great storm. Jesus is in the hinder part of the, the ship, sound asleep. And, and how about he's sleeping through thunder, he's sleeping through hard rain, but when his disciples begin to cry out, that woke him up. Just like a great mother can sleep through a tornado, but if that baby cries four rooms down the hall, man, she jumps up and runs, runs to him. And Jesus, you know the story, gets up and he, he rebukes the wind and the waves. And in chapter 4, he calms the wild wind and waves. And in chapter 5, he'll calm something wilder still and he will face 2,000 demons inside one man's body. And he will calm them demons. There's been much speculation uh, uh, given to verse number 2 of Mark 5. Immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. And, uh, and, I, and I know the geography there is the, the tombs were elevated up on a mountainside overlooking the sea. And, and there's a good chance that maybe this man was sitting outside of his tombs, you know, cutting himself with stones and, and howling at the storm and saw that ship just going up and down and, and then saw a man stand up and put his hands up and that, that just came a great calm. And, and so maybe he saw him and I, I, I don't know if all that's true. That's all just speculation. But what I do know is true is in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 35, it, or Mark 4 verse 35, it was Jesus' idea to go to the other side. It was God's idea to go to that other side. And so Jesus was crossing the sea on purpose. Now verse number 1 said that he's entering into the country of the Gadarenes. The Gadarenes. And if the Bible maps are true, right across this, this, this lake of Genesaret, right across this body of water from where he landed, is the town called Magdala. Right across. Now that may not mean anything to you, but I bet the name Mary Magdalene means something to you. You remember much about your Bible. Mary Magdalene was a lady out of whom Jesus cast seven devils. 
Jesus cast seven devils out of her and it's his idea now to go across the sea directly to the other side where there's a man not possessed with seven devils but with 2,000 devils and I believe Jesus is coming across this thing on purpose and right about the middle of the way through there as this great storm is just a blowing and rain falling and thunder hitting and lightning striking, Jesus Christ stands up and that God body thunders out a command to be still and, to, and, and, and rebukes it. And I believe them evil spirits up in them tombs, I believe they heard that God voice. They heard it coming. If they didn't hear it coming, I believe they felt it coming. And they knew that the Son of God was on his way to where they were. I believe that's why that man came out. I believe that's why. And so he comes out of the, he comes out of the tombs. And Mark chapter 5 is really, really about really about those three things. But there's many miracles in Mark 5. This one we've just read is about demons. And then the next section is about a woman who had an issue of blood 12 years. Y'all remember that passage of Scripture? So then Jesus works a miracle on disease. And then immediately following that, he goes into the bedroom of, of Jairus' daughter, this little girl that had died. She was 12 years old, and he raises her from the dead. So we have uh, miracles and demons, miracles and disease, and miracles in death. We have God working a great miracle for a man, for a woman, and for a child. We have God working miracles for a man, for a woman, and for a child. Hey, he's a conqueror for you, sir. He's a cure giver for you, ma'am. And he's a caregiver for our children. Hey, what about a God that's not just God for the grown folks? He's not just God for the men. He's God for me. He's God for my wife. And he's God for my babies. Hey, what a good God you and I serve. David said in Psalms 89, he said, I'll make known my faithfulness to all generation. I've got written now next to my verse in my Bible. I've got a big stick figure and a little stick figure and another little stick figure and another little stick figure and another little stick figure because David's making known the faithfulness of God to all generations and if we look in Mark chapter 5 we see a man we see a woman and we see a child aren't you glad he's God for every single one of us in here hey man what a good God Mark chapter 5 this wonderful passage of scripture this first section we're going to look at is about three things. It's about the tombs, it's about the tormentor, and it's about the time. It's about the tombs, and the tormentor, and the time. In verse number two, as soon as Jesus gets there, immediately there met a man, there met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. And verse number four, he's up in these up in these tombs because society can't handle him anywhere else. He's been just driven out there. And, and verse number four says that he would break, he would break asunder those chains and, and, and those fetters. And, and this man is just living out in the tombs and he's living out in the night. And, and he's, uh, Luke chapter 8 said that he wear no clothes and, and he's naked and he's cutting himself with stones. And here is a man living in the midst of utmost anguish and anxiety and, and the devil is just wreaking havoc on this man and no more place is fitting for him than the tombs. We were in New Orleans a week or two ago and we drove through their cemetery. Now their cemeteries aren't like ours. They're, since New Orleans is below sea level, they, have to, they can't bury anything. It'll just all come back up with the water. And so their, their graves are all like, uh, what are them things called? Uh, yeah, them things. And uh, they're all this spooky looking. But, but we live in a generation that's obsessed with death. We live in a generation that's obsessed with darkness. And I just want to say it ain't a joke. The, the movies, it's not just, oh, because it makes me, it just, it scares me. I mean, are, are you so numb that you can't feel anything unless something evil's around you? Are you so numb? Uh, anyway, this man's in the tombs. He's not at home with his family like many of you were this afternoon. He's certainly not in church with the, with the beloved brethren. He's certainly not singing hymns. He's... He's crying all night. He's cutting himself with, with, with stones. He is, he is a tormented man. And these demons are having their way with him. 
And they could not, verse 4 says, neither could any man tame him. And we'll come back to that in a minute. But Jesus wasn't there to tame him. Jesus was there to transform him. So it's about the tombs. But then these devils begin to speak up. And I want you to look closely at the wording of your Bible here. Verse 6, when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him and cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. Say the next word. Are y'all looking at your Bible? Verse number 8, 4. He said unto him. So verse number 7 really comes after verse 8. Does that make sense? Verse number 7 is there because of what Jesus said in verse number 8. When this man comes to worship Jesus, Jesus tells them foul spirits to come out. And he calls it an unclean spirit. And so the spirits respond in verse number 7. What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I said a minute ago, though the world may not know much of Christ, these devils do. They recognize his name. Look, and I like the fact that they called him Jesus. See, that's the name that God told Joseph to name him. So that, that, that lets me know that's an eternal name. It's an eternal name. And so the devil said, what are we to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of the most high God? I adjure thee by God that thou, say the next word, torment me not. And so the tormentor, Brother Bo, in this chapter, it's not the devils, it's Christ himself. Christ to us is the great shepherd of the sheep. Christ to us is the author and finisher of our faith. Christ to you and I is the friend of publicans and sinners. Christ to you and I is wonderful, counselor, governor. Christ to you and I is altogether lovely. Christ to you and I is fairer than 10,000. Christ to you and I is the lily of the valley. Christ to you and I is the balm of Gilead. Christ to you and I is the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. But Christ to those spirits, he's tormentor. He's tormentor because his objective is not to babysit the devils. It's not to bless the devils, but God's ultimate objective is to bind those devils and bind them in chains and cast them into everlasting fire and darkness and torment them for an eternity times eternity. He's the tormentor. He shows up as the boss. He shows up as their worst nightmare. He shows up as their greatest fear. The last name they want to hear. The last face they want to see. The last voice they want to feel. The last emotion they ever want to experience is Jesus Christ, the tormentor. He's a tormentor to them. But if you'll hold that and look in Mark 8, just want you to see one word. This is about the tombs. It's about the tormentor. Mark, uh, Matthew chapter 8, this is the same record, but it adds one, one little bitty line. Verse 29, Matthew 8 verse 29, Jesus, what have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? Before the time. You rest assured one thing, that the devil knoweth that he hath but a short time. And you rest assured, though we know not the day nor the hour of Christ's return, and those things are not for us to know. Jesus told them disciples, last thing he said in the book of Acts, he said, it is not for you to know the times nor the seasons. Don't, be, don't, don't get wrapped up in it. Don't get lost in it. It's not up to us. But them, devil know, them devils know there's a time coming when their torment will begin. But they know that that time is not this time. They know that this time is not that time. Brethren, since Genesis 3 until the present day, you and I are living in the dispensation of demonic liberty. You and I are living in the dispensation of demonic liberty. Liberty. Since the Garden of Eden, the devils have been free. 
They've roamed this earth. In the book of Job, as God asked Satan, where have you been? He said, from walking to and fro on the earth. He said, that's Old Testament. Well, New Testament, 1 Peter chapter 5, the devil as a roaring lion walketh about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And what we find in Mark chapter 5 is a man caught in the middle of a horrible time to be alive. And you and I live in the same time. And I know dispensationally, I know, since the, I know things changed when the gospel was completed and the fullness of time had come and, and Christ died and uh, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. And, but we still live in this dispensation of demonic liberty. You and I still have to face a world cursed and run by Satan. And we live in this time. They said, how have you come to torment us before the time? There's a time coming, according to the book of the Revelation, where God will bind all of that and will cast it into hell for all eternity. And in heaven, we will never deal with that again. But that time is not this time. You and I, as God's people, are living in a world filled with evil spirits. I'm not trying to sound spooky or sensational or, or weird or kooky, but you and I, we must acknowledge the fact that all of the Bible is true. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for, cor for correction, for instruction and in righteousness. And the Bible is true no matter what it's saying. If it's giving you a Bible verse about salvation, this word is true. If it's giving you a Bible verse about separation, this word is true. If it's giving you a Bible verse about spirits, this word is true. Beloved, get your head out of the sand. You live in a world that is overrun by sickening, filthy, demonic, satanic spirits. It's the truth, brethren. It's the truth. And this man that we find in Mark chapter 5 is facing the business end of 2,000 demons. And it ends wonderful for him. But in these first few verses, this man is a hostage. He is bound. And though the, he's not bound with a chain, he's bound inside. That's the worst kind of bondage. It's the worst kind of bondage to have the strength to do whatever you would, verse number four, but to be bound and locked up so strongly on the inside. This man is captive to thousands of enemies. I want you to look at three things about these devils, and I hope this will be a help. I want you to notice, number one, the nature. The nature of these devils. In verse number nine, Jesus asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion. My name is Legion. The word legion is a military term. When Christ was in the garden of Gethsemane and, and those uh, men were coming to arrest him and, and Peter grabbed a sword and he cut that high priest's servant ear off. Jesus picked it up and fixed it and told Peter to put a sword up and he said, don't you know I could call 12 legions of angels? It's a military term. It's a war term. So this group of devils identifies itself as not a big crowd, but as a legion. Some of you men were in the military, and, and you, can probably, you could probably stand right now and tell me the battalion name that you were a part of, the 44th Airborne Division or whatever the case may be. Them military groups, them war units, they have a name. They have a nature, they have a name. And this, this demon, these demons, as they spoke out, they said, my name is Legion. And Legion, it doesn't just mean a group. It, it is a military term. It is a, not just a group of men, it is a band of soldiers. And these demons were not just bad guys. They're adversaries. The Bible calls the devil our adversary. Because he is exactly that. He, he's not just a bad figure in the universe. We're at war with him. He is at war with us. 
And the nature of this, these devils, this, the nature of this legion was, was a war nature. Now, I, I know most of us in here have not been in the military and uh, have not been in war, but what does a war unit do? If you have a battalion of soldiers, what do they do? Well, they work together for one thing. They work together. So in this man's body, in this man's flesh, there is a war unit compiled of 2,000. That's like a whole army. So there's a whole army, and they're all working together for the same purpose, to ruin this man. They all have the same purpose, and they're working together. And so one bad spirit leads to another bad spirit. And that bad spirit leads to another bad spirit. And that bad spirit leads to another bad spirit. Y'all see what I'm saying? They work together. They're not content to just make the man be bound up in this evil. That evil's going to lead to this evil. And then that evil's going to lead to this evil. And it's going to bring those evils with it. And it's just going gonna, just gonna to get more evil and more evil and get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Y'all understand what I'm saying? It's a war unit. They're working together. I remember in uh, the book of Matthew that was wrote about a man that uh, uh, some spirits were cast out of him. And then they come back and they brought seven other spirits greater than themselves. You can, you can ignore this if you'd like, but I've got too much Bible to say otherwise. There's a hierarchy in them spirits. Without studying demonology, and I, and I, would, I would advise you never do that. And I have not, will not, by the grace of God. But just by reading your Bible, you will quickly learn there is a hierarchy to it. In the angel system, there's archangels. That's enough. And there is a legion, a military-minded, war-minded, battle-minded legion of demons living inside this man. War units don't just work together. War units plan. And they hide. And they disguise themselves. It's very quiet. And my prayer from this message is that God would, re- would open your eyes to what the devil and his spirits have been doing to you in your life. They hide. They camouflage themselves. They work together. They don't just plan, they plan backup plans. You see in verse number 3, this man had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains, because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains. And so the society said, we've got to fix this guy. We've got to lock him up. We've got to secure this. We've got to tighten this thing up. And so they put chains on him. And so the devils had a backup plan. Let's give him supernatural strength. I don't think that was the initial plan. I don't think they lured him in with supernatural strength. If they done, if that was, if that had existed before, they wouldn't have tried chains and fetters. So the so the spirits had a backup plan. This society, this man had gone through a, a process to maybe better himself or at least stop the bleeding and stop the damage, but the devils had a backup plan. And they gave him an, an option on how to get out. And is that not what happens to you and I? The devils get inside our mind. The devils get inside our lives. And we find ourselves trapped in sin and snared in wickedness. And so we put up safeguards and we put up guardrails. And we, we do this and we do that. But guess what? The devil had a backup plan the whole time. And we fall again. And we stumble again. And he traps us again. And he comes out of nowhere again. He's hidden. He's snuck in somewhere. The little fox is spoiled of iron. And he comes out of nowhere. Man, we're right back where we were to begin with. And you don't want to admit that it's demonic. You don't want to say that it's an evil spirit. But beloved brethren, Paul said, If I sin, it's no more I, but sin that dwelleth in me. Can I tell you that you live in the dispensation of demonic activity and saved or lost. There is an evil ever present in this world that does its best to snare you into sin. 
backup plans. The nature of this is war. I just want to say it's more serious than you probably thought in the past. I just want to say that it's more real than what you thought in the past. Now, I could be mistaken, Brother William, but I think there's at least 12 different times in the Gospel of Mark alone where Christ is getting demons out of people. I mean, why do we think it's changed? Why, why, why do we think this is any different? Everything's not a medical condition. I know there are some. I know there are children born with this, born with that. Everything's not a medical condition. We live in this dispensation of demonic act, liberty, as this man did. The nature of it's a war nature battle nature. But notice in verse number 9 as well the number. The number. My name is Legion for we are many. In verse number 13 as they went into the herd of swine it said there was about 2,000. So we've got a couple thousand demons. And could you imagine being this man? Could you imagine being the man filled with not just some devils, but thousands of them? No matter which way the man turns, if he thinks about his hands, there's demons. If he thinks about his feet, there's demons. If he thinks about his mind, there's demons. If he looks in his memories, there's demons. If he looks in his emotions, there's demons. If, if he had a family, if he looks in there, he sees demons. He sees evil and he sees wickedness and he sees darkness. And no matter which way this man looks, there is evil and sin everywhere around him. What a miserable existence. All hiding in one body of flesh in one body dwelled 2,000 devils disguised as just one spirit disguised as this one nut job that's crazy was an army of evil fallen angels what a sad commentary and I can't help as I read this and think about the youth of America. My generation, the millennials, so full of hell. So full of demons. I can say it, I am one. So full of wickedness. I just wonder how many, how many, how many spirits, how many devils. It took a whole herd of swine to carry off what that man had been carrying. It took an entire herd, 2,000 pigs, to carry off what this man had been living with. I don't, so, some say that God allowed those demons to go in the swine because swine were an unclean animal and it was his uh, uh, denunciation of the swine. Uh, I would remind you that God created that swine. And I don't think God put those spirits in those swine as an insult to pigs, but maybe more so to provoke sympathy on this man. You've got to understand, compassion on a vexed man is pretty hard to come by. Compassion on a man that's done this much damage to a town... In, in, the, in Matthew's record, it said that he was so fierce that nobody would even pass by that way. <laughs> I sure am glad Jesus would. Yeah. Well, could you imagine if someone told you to go love this man? Hey, y'all pray for old so-and-so out there in the tombs. Y'all uh, have pity on him. Pity on him. We're terrified of this man. We're scared to death of this fellow. I think maybe perhaps Christ put these spirits inside an entire herd of swine just to emphasize the suffering and anguish and strength that he was bound under. Can you imagine now probably all of his 
wrongdoing made sense. All of the crazy things, all of the nightmares he had caused now made sense and explained it. 2,000. What a poor, poor soul. Not just the nature and the number, but I would have you notice lastly the news. The news. In verse 13, these spirits have gone out of the man into this herd of swine and they've run violently down a steep place into the sea and were choked. Verse 14, they that fed the swine fled and told it in the city and in the country. And they went out to see what it it was that was done. And they come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind. What a transformation. They were afraid. Let me just say this and we'll try to move on past it, but I do want to say that I think most people are just afraid of the power of God. I think we're just afraid of it. We're, We're more on the fence of we'd rather just tame the problems and not seek out the power of God to transform them. Well, let's just bring it on home to ourselves. I think some of us would just rather tame our own problems than let God transform us. What did Jesus say in Mark chapter 9 about them, about them spirits that were in that little boy that then disciples couldn't cast out? He said, this kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. One of the hardest things a human can do. Fasting's not a diet. It's not drink broth and Gatorade all week while you're fasting. Fasting is a complete abstinence from nutrition altogether. As Jesus fasted with only water. As Moses and Elijah fasted, that's fasting. That transformation requires such power, and I think most of us are afraid of it. I think most Christians are afraid of it. There are times I'm afraid of it. These men came out and they were afraid. And in verse 16, And they that saw it told them how it befell to him that was possessed with the devil. Brethren, like the crucifixion, these things were not done in a corner. In broad daylight, Jesus cast these demons out. And they that fed the swine saw it and they told the news. They told the news. They were there. They saw how it happened. And they repeated the story. They re- it, it, Like on Facebook, you repost and retweet and reshare. They retold the story. They, they told the news of what had happened to this man who was once a lunatic and bound up in chains and living in the tombs. Now he's clothed and in his right mind there with Jesus. And they told how it happened. And so then in verse number uh, 18, when he was coming to the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. He wants to stay with Jesus. And I say amen to that. I'd want to stay with Jesus too. Don't leave me alone. Don't, don't leave me here without you. You, <laughs> I was bound and... I was, I was dying, and I was miserable, and I was, I was afraid of my own self, and I'd become a monster. But, but when you came, when you got to where I was, you set me free from thousands of enemies, and I want to be with you. Don't leave me here by myself. Let me go with you. I don't want to see these people. I don't want to see this place. I don't want to see that mountainside. I don't want to hear that sea roar. I want to go with you. And I know, brethren, we are vexed in this world. And with all our hearts, we want to leave every trace of it behind. We're in a straight betwixt two, like Paul said. And to be with Jesus is far better. He wants to go and be with Jesus. Verse number 19, Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends, and tell them. Go tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee and hath had compassion on thee. 
You see, Jesus wasn't satisfied with others telling his story. He wanted him to go tell his story. He wanted him first to go home where probably most of the damage had been done. Let's assume the man's married. Let's assume the man's a father. Let's just make an assumption. Can you imagine the train wreck that he's left behind? Let's assume the man had parents. That's a pretty safe assumption. Let's assume he had siblings. Let's assume maybe he was born into a family with a good name. Maybe he had a good daddy who was respected in town. Maybe he had a good godly mama that everybody thought highly of. Can you imagine the train wreck that this man possessed with 2,000 devils has left behind? And Jesus said, no, you can't come with me. Go home. Go home where you've made a mess. Go home where you've wrecked it. Go home where the devil ruined everything and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee. Go tell them what God's done for you. Go tell them how I had compassion on you. Go tell them how I loved you when nobody else would love you. Go tell them how I saved you when couldn't nobody else save you. Go tell them how I set you free when nobody else could. Go tell them. Go tell the news. Go tell the news. And I ask you tonight, do you have any news? Do you have any news to tell? Do you have any news where God's walked into your life and set you free from a bondage of wickedness? And maybe you wouldn't like to admit that there was an evil spirit in your mind. Maybe you don't want to admit that there was some type of demon living in your flesh. Maybe you don't want to say that out loud. But what you ought to say is that God's done great things for me. He's had compassion on me. And he set me free from thousands of enemies. I told you already that Jesus came over here on purpose. Mark chapter 4 and verse 35. He came over there on purpose. He came over there on purpose, I believe, for this man. Not just for this man. I believe he came over for this news. I believe he came so this story would exist. So that thousands of years later, as, as God's people are breaking under pressure of evil in this world, we could go to a prayer closet and pray and say, God, can you? And he would say, oh, yes, I can. And I can do more than that. I can set you free from thousands of enemies. There's a man that lived in Gadara who was possessed with 2,000 demons, an extreme case. Yes, I know, but his was no match for me. And I had enough power and I had enough compassion and I had enough grace and I had enough mercy to set that old guy free who never even asked for it. I can set you free. There's too many of God's children living in bondage. There's too many God's people living in bondage. And I just want to say this and I'll be done. I've preached a long time. When this man saw Jesus, he came, verse number six, he ran worship him he ran and he worshiped him before he was set free before the devils were gone before the problem was fixed before he had his mind back you got to know that was a torment all in itself Losing his mind. Before he had all that back, he ran and worshiped. And I know this might sound cliche. And I know this may sound like a pretty poem. But can I say this? If you want out of bondage, we've got to start praising God. We've got to start lifting up our hands. 
and praising the almighty son of the most high God. Even though the problem's still there. And even though the wickedness is still there. And the evil still haunts you. And your mind's still wracked with awful memories. And you can't escape the guilt. I encourage you to not get on your knees. Lift up holy hands toward heaven. And worship the son of the most high God. And praise his holy name. And bless him. And thank him. And adore him for who he is is and for what he is it is the doorway to freedom he never asked he only adored he never prayed he only praised and Christ set the man free from thousands of enemies and as the church has spiraled down into bondage deeper than it's ever known It's gotten so far from real, holy worship. We've gotten so far from real, holy worship. And I can't help but wonder if that's not why the bondage is so much stronger today than it's ever been. Because God's people, God's people, have forgotten how to worship. The devils ran into the swine and immediately there was a violent death. The pigs didn't last five minutes and the devils killed them. Could not the devils have done that to that man? And then gone and got another man? And then gone and got another man? What's the difference between the swine and the sinner? What's the difference between the swine and the sinner? Well, one... A demon-possessed hog brings no reproach to God. Who cares? If an animal acts like it's got a devil, shoot it. Throw it off a cliff. It brings no reproach to its maker. If a hog has no clothes on, well, that's how God made it. But if a man has no clothes on, brings reproach to his maker. If if an animal harms itself, eh, but when a person, it brings reproach to our maker. So in the swine, there's no reproach. In the swine, let me say this, there's no resistance. There's something missing from the animal kingdom, from the kingdom of men. They don't have a soul. They, I know the little cartoon, All Dogs Go to Heaven, that's cute and whatever, and I promise you, if, if you have Fifi and it dies, I promise you, it'll be in heaven one day for you, okay? I'll just let you, I'll just let you believe that. But there's no soul. There's no conscience. Saved or lost, every so every, every person born has something on the inside that knows good from evil. That knows the devil is bad. There is an ever-living, undying resistance. And so when them demons inhabit this man, there is constant tension. There is a constant fight. There is a constant resistance. And they love it. And they thrive off of it. Because man has a special will that God did not give to the animal kingdom. And as this man is possessed with two things, well, glory to God, as this man is possessed with a legion of demons. When he saw Christ afar off, 
somewhere inside there was enough willpower to run to Jesus and worship him. There was enough inside of him to know everything in me is bad, but everything in him is good. and Everything in me is dark, and that's the light of the world. And there was something in him that ran to him and worshiped him even in the midst of all the devils. You say we can't worship God because the devil's too bad. If this man can worship God, we can worship God. If this man can praise the Lord and run for him, you and I can praise the Lord and run to him. Praise God. And he was freed from thousands of enemies. And it's my heart's desire that every person in our church be freed from the enemies that they face. You may face one and I may face another, but we serve a God who's conquered them all. We serve a God who's over them all. Turn to Psalm 66. Miss Leslie, can you come? Psalm 66. While you're turning there and back in our text in Mark chapter 5, the man goes home and the Bible says that he began to publish in the capitalist how great things Jesus had done for him and all men did marvel. There's a verse I skipped and I saved it for now, but, or the Holy Ghost saved it for now. When those men saw what Christ had done, they asked him to leave. Verse number 17 of Mark 5. They asked him to get out of town. You've just heard our pocket. We are afraid of you. Leave. And so they asked Jesus to leave. The next time Jesus crosses this body of water <laughs> and comes to this same town, there's a Bible says there's a multitude there. They've got their sick folk, they've got their lame folk, they've got their blind folk, and they've got their possessed folk, and they all are waiting on Christ. Why? Because this fellow has ran through town and told them what Jesus has done, and all men marveled, and they couldn't wait for him to come back. And so Psalm 66, verse 16, Come and hear all ye that fear God, and I will declare <laughs> I will declare what he hath done for my soul. I cried unto him with my mouth, and he was extolled with my tongue. You say, what does that mean? It means he was exalted, he was praised, he was given honor, he was given glory, he was given a high title, he was given what he deserved with his tongue. Verse 18, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me, but verily God hath heard me. He hath attended to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God. <laughs> Blessed be God which hath not turned away my prayer nor his mercy from me. If that guy had had a Bible and had Psalm 66, I believe he'd have preached every morning and every afternoon and every night saying, Blessed be God which hath not turned away my prayer. I prayed, and he heard, and he freed me from thousands of enemies. Come, all ye that hear, that fear God, and I will tell you what he hath done for my soul. Go and tell the news. Do you have any news to tell? Do you have any news to tell? And you may say, Preacher, not yet. Preacher, not yet. I'm still chained. I look free on the outside, but on the inside I'm in a hole. And I'm in a prison cell and I can't get out. If I regard iniquity in my heart. The Lord will not hear me. <laughs> but. Aren't you glad for them buts in the Bible? But. But. The Lord heard my prayer. You can be free. You can be free from thousands of enemies. As I was, I'll tell you how this message was born. I was praying about my own, my own struggles, my own stuff. And it was like the Lord 
thundered this in my mind and in my heart. And it was as if Mark chapter 5 was playing over a loudspeaker inside my heart. He said, my name is Legion for we are many. And it only took one God. It only took one Jesus. And it only took one moment. It just took one command and they were all gone. We can be free from thousands of enemies. Let's stand to our feet.